day, long ago, God's word came to Jonah, Amite's son. Up on your feet and on your way to the big city of Nineveh. Preach to them. They're in a bad way and I can't ignore it any longer. But Jonah got up and went the other direction to Tarshish, running away from God. He went down to the port of Joppa and found a ship headed for Tarshish. He paid the fare and went on board, joining those going to Tarshish as far away from God as he could get. But God sent a huge storm at sea, the waves towering. The ship was about to break into pieces. The sailors were terrified. They called out in desperation to their gods. They threw everything they were carrying overboard to light the ship. Meanwhile, Jonah had gone down into the hold of the ship to take a nap. He was sound asleep. The captain came to him and said, What's this? Sleeping. Get up. Pray to your god. Maybe your god will see that we're in trouble and rescue us. Then the sailors said to one another, Let's get to the bottom of this. Let's draw straws to identify the culprit on the ship who's responsible for this disaster. So they drew the short straws. Jonah got the short straw. Then they grilled him. Confess, why this disaster? What is your work? Where do you come from? What country? What family? I'm a Hebrew. I worship God, the God of heaven who made sea and land. At that, the men were frightened, really frightened, and said, What on earth have you done? As Jonah talked, the sailors realised that he was running away from God. They said to him, What are we going to do with you to get rid of this storm? By this time, the sea was wild, totally out of control. Jonah said, Throw me overboard, into the sea, then the storm will stop. It's all my fault. I'm the cause of the storm. Get rid of me and you'll get rid of the storm. But no, the men tried rowing back to shore. They made no headway. The storm only got worse and worse, wild and raging. Then they prayed to God. Oh God, don't let us drown because of this man's life. And don't blame us for his death. You are God. Do what you think is best. They took Jonah and threw him overboard. Immediately, the sea was quietened down. The sailors were impressed. No longer terrified by the sea, but in awe of God. They worshipped God, offered a sacrifice and made vows. Then God assigned a huge fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah was in the fish's belly for three days and nights. How? You throw me into ocean's depths, into a watery grave. With ocean wave, ocean breakers crashing over me. I have been thrown away, thrown out, out of your sight. I will never again lay eyes on your holy temple. Oh God, my God, has my prayer got through to you? Has it made it all the way to your holy temple? Those who worship holy gods, god frauds, walk away from their only true love. But I'm worshipping you, God, calling out thanksgiving. And I will do what I promised to do. Salvation belongs to God. Then God spoke to the fish and it vomited up Jonah on the seashore. Next, God spoke to Jonah a second time. Up on your feet and on your way to the big city of Nineveh. Preach to them. They're in a bad way and I can't ignore it any longer. This time Jonah started off straight for Nineveh obeying God's orders to the letter. Nineveh was a big city, very big. It took three days to walk across it. Jonah entered the city, went one day's walk and preached. In 40 days, Nineveh will be smashed. The people of Nineveh listened and trusted God. They proclaimed a citywide fast and dressed in burlap to show their repentance. Everyone did it, rich and poor, famous and obscure, leaders and followers. When the message reached the king of Nineveh, he got off his throne, threw down his royal robes, dressed in burlap and sat down in the dirt. Then he issued a public proclamation throughout Nineveh, authorised by him and his leaders. Not one drop of water, not one bite of food for man, woman or animal, including your herds and flocks. Dress them all, both people and animals, in burlap and send up a cry for help to God. Everyone must turn around 
turn back from an evil life and the violent ways that stain their hands. Who knows? Maybe God will turn around and change his mind about us. Quit being angry with us and let us live. God saw what they had done, that they had turned away from their evil lives. He did change their mind about them. What he said he would do to them, he didn't do. Jonah was furious. He lost his temper. He yelled at God. God, I knew it. When I was back home, I knew this was going to happen. That's why I ran off to Tarshish. I knew you were sheer grace and mercy, not easily angered, rich in love, and ready at the drop of a hat to turn your plans of punishment into a program of forgiveness. So God, if you won't kill them, kill me. I'm better off dead. God said, What do you have to be angry about? But Jonah just left. He went out to the city to the east and sat down in the sulk. He put together a makeshift shelter of leafy branches and sat there in the shade to see what would happen to the city. God arranged for a broad leaf tree to spring up. It grew over Jonah to cool him off and get him out of his angry sulk. Jonah was pleased and enjoyed the shade. Life was looking up. But then God sent a worm. By dawn the next day, the worm had bored into the shade tree and it had withered away. The sun came up and God sent a hot, blistering wind from the east. The sun beat down on Jonah's head and he started to faint. He prayed to die. I'm better off dead. Then God said to Jonah, What right do you have to get angry about the shade tree? Jonah said, Plenty of right. It's made me angry enough to die. God said, What's this? How is it you can change your feelings from pleasure to anger overnight about a mere shade tree that you did nothing to get? You neither planted nor watered it. It grew up one night and died the next night. So, why can't I likewise change what I feel about Nineveh from anger to pleasure, this big city of more than 120,000 childlike people who don't yet know right from wrong to say nothing of all the innocent animals?